CLP Video, Master Books, and Creation Science Ministries present Answers in Genesis. Session number two, Dinosaurs and the Bible. Featuring internationally recognized author and speaker on the topic of creation versus evolution, Gary Parker. Well, uh, sorry we didn't get the uh, word out in time to you to, uh, for proper makeup for the screen test that you're about to have. <laughs> uh, but I trust that will go okay anyway. Uh, I'd like to bring you greetings from uh, Clearwater Christian College, uh, where I'm teaching now. Uh, that's a four-year uh, fully accredited liberal arts college uh, right on Tampa Bay, uh, about halfway down the west side of Florida. Most importantly, it's just 90 miles from Disneyland or Disney World. <laughs> So if you get a chance to get in that area, we'd invite you to come by and uh, visit the Science Center. We have it open to the public with some displays on uh, the, some of the topics we'll be talking about today, about dinosaurs and fossils and the beginnings of the world. Okay, just to start with, hands up all those who always wanted to go on a dinosaur hunt. Oh, not bad, not bad, okay. <laughs> Well, it just so happens my wife and I have had that privilege of going and hunting dinosaurs summer before last. Uh, I think we must have brought back about 200 pounds of dinosaur fossils from Canada. I think maybe I should be paying a property tax up there. We brought some things along with us. You can come down and take a look at uh, maybe afterwards. This is a little bit of backbone of one of these dinosaurs. The nice thing is uh, that you really don't need a high-powered rifle to go on a dinosaur hunt these days. We tend to find them just as fossils. Uh, bits and pieces, traces, bones, and so on of once living things preserved in rock layers laid down uh, on all the continents around the world. And a, a fossil can be a bone. In fact, we got some leg bones and plaster casts about so long, just, just the top of a leg bone of one of these dinosaurs. My wife found a, a tyrannosaur tooth. We'll return to that one in a little while, complete with some of the serrations on it. But sometimes it's only a, a footprint, a track, and that counts as a fossil. That gives you information on how the animal once lived and so on. Perhaps one of the more interesting things uh, is a kind of fossil uh, that, that, well, looks like this. This is just a small piece here. Uh, this is a very informative kind of fossil called a coprolite. Anybody know what a coprolite is that is willing to tell the rest of us? <laughs> I think maybe some of you do. Well, <laughs> A uh, coprolite, if I can figure out how to say this properly, is a fossil animal dung, animal droppings. <laughs> and it can tell you quite a lot about the animal. <laughs> now this is just a small piece, for instance, you can ordinarily tell the difference between a rabbit and a dinosaur on the basis of the size alone. <laughs> but you can actually uh, take thin sections of this. There are people that do this. By the way, it's turned to rock. It doesn't come off in your hands. It doesn't smell anymore, anything like that. <laughs> So you can slice these things, look at them under a microscope, and get some idea of what the animal ate, whether there's a little bit of undigested wood or bits of broken bone and so on in there. Uh, so those tell us a lot about this awesome group of animals that we call dinosaurs. Well, of course, there's a lot of interest in dinosaurs today in the public media. And so it might be interesting for us to ask, well, what does the Bible have to say about dinosaurs? Well, that sounds kind of strange. Most people would say, well, the Bible doesn't have anything to say about dinosaurs. Exactly the opposite. The Bible has quite a lot to say about dinosaurs. One of the most famous passages there is the one in the book of Job. That's kind of a special book. That's where God is speaking to Job uh, out of the whirlwind and answering questions that Job has. And, and he takes them all the way back to the beginning. God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And he begins to talk about the wonders of creation, about the stars in the sky, about the wild horse, about the ostrich, about many animals that the translators knew what animals they were. But then he gets to this one. Behold now behemoth which I made with thee. And then it starts describing this awesome animal. He had bones like bars of iron. Uh, his strength was in the muscles of his belly. He moved his tail like a cedar tree. Well, now some of you have modern translations and there might be a note in the margin, well, well, this is an elephant, a rhino, or a hippo. What kind of tail does an elephant, rhino, or a hippo have? <laughs> like a big, big cedar tree? Yeah. Like a little piece of rope, 
or read something like that. No, this had a, a tail like a cedar tree, a symbol of strength and power right on through Scripture. In fact, it says it can hold its mouth against the mighty rushing of the Jordan River at flood stage. Now, there used to be big animals like that that lived in the Jordan River, rhinos, hippos, and things. When the floods came, they fled to high ground. But not behemoth. It could stand against the mighty rushing of the Jordan River. The more we read and study, the more we realize that the animal described is pretty much like this model that I have here. In fact, the name Diplodocus uh, actually means double beam. The strength is literally in the muscles of the belly to move the long neck and head on one end and the long cedar-like tail on the other end. Now, this is one, by the way, we used to call Brontosaurus. Well, I hate to tell you this, but poor old Brontosaurus never really existed. It was a mistake. <laughs> and somebody found the body of a dinosaur in one quarry, found the head in the quarry a few miles away, and got the wrong head on the wrong dinosaur, and forgot to tell the post office. <laughs> Some of you may have collected those four stamps with four different kinds of dinosaurs, but they've still got Brontosaurus on there. The correct name now would either be Apatosaurus, or Diplodocus, one of those two dinosaurs. But there were animals like this that roamed the earth, and the people who translated the Bible knew that it wasn't an elephant, rhino, or hippo, so they just took the Hebrew letters and changed it to this form so we could pronounce it like Yahweh and the Jehovah. Okay, quiz time. Okay, get ready to raise your hand. Hands up all those that think that this is a life-size model of the mighty behemoth that once roamed the earth. Nobody? Got to be somebody. Uh, nobody gets any extra credit. Believe it or not, this is a life-size model of the mighty behemoth when? When it first hatched out of its egg. <laughs> See, you made a mistake many evolutionists make. <laughs> They're always forgetting about the women and the children. <laughs> And so dinosaurs hatched out of eggs. As a matter of fact, we found a great many dinosaur eggs, some in Montana, some in Alberta, Canada. There's a new find there, lots of them, in the Gobi Desert. Sometimes a little baby dinosaur is still in the egg. And so many of these are only about the size of ostrich eggs. The biggest is only about the size of a football. So when behemoth first hatched out, it would be about this size. You could hold it in your hand, pet it like that, put a little string around neck, take it to school with you, and so on. <laughs> nice to have one of these things. <laughs> well, the same thing is true about uh, this one right here. Who knows what dinosaur this is? Yes, yeah, right there on the front row. Tyrannosaurus, okay, Tyrannosaurus rex. <laughs> and according to all the films and so on, this is the mightiest dinosaur of them all. This is the one that, according to one film, <laughs> eats jeeps, okay. <laughs> And in the other films, this is the one that snaps the head off of the Plotticus or rips the guts out of a Triceratops or wrestles an Allosaurus over a cliff. But when the mighty Tyrannosaur hatched out, it would only be about this size. You could hold it in your hands again, pet it like that. Uh, you could even let it perch on your shoulder like a parrot. Uh-oh. What would happen if you let a Tyrannosaur perch on your shoulder? Yeah, rip your ear off, rip your head off, worse than that, and so on. <laughs> And so this is the one that's usually considered uh, this awesome, vicious predator. But as scientists have taken a second look at Tyrannosaur, and uh, maybe that's not all so after all. Now, when you look at just the tooth, now you're looking at a pretty awesome structure here. Uh, the tooth, you know, has a backward curve to it, kind of a point on the end and so on. The one my wife found even has a little cutting serrations on it. About six inches or 15 centimeters of tooth here sunk down into the jaw. And so it looks like it would be an awesome weapon of destruction until you realize that this great big long tooth like this has only sunk about one inch down into the jaw. Scientists now recognize that if Tyrannosaur really had grabbed a Triceratops or some dinosaur that could fight back, grabbed him like that and pulled back, and he'd throw all the teeth out of his mouth. <laughs> so then he wouldn't even be able to eat what he killed. So that would be kind of a hazard as far as this is concerned. And instead of walking around upright in a position for chasing other dinosaurs, it really looks like Tyrannosaur walked around bent over somewhat like this with its great big four and a half to five foot jaw down near the ground for ripping and slashing into watermelons, pumpkins, cantaloupes, things of that nature. It may have been a vegetarian 
it may have been a carrion eater, something like a vulture that eats animals that have already died and so on, that can't get back. Well, scientists know that you can't really tell what an animal ate by looking at the teeth. In fact, here's another question I have for you. This one comes from Creation Magazine. I'll tell you a little bit more about that magazine later. It's put out by the Australian Creation Science Foundation, available here in America. It's just full of all kinds of interesting things, uh, including this one. What do you think this animal ate? My wife asked that of some young people in our science center one time, and one person said, anything he wants to. <laughs> and he certainly had that mean, vicious appearance, but uh, believe it or not, this is just a silver langer monkey, and all it eats is just leaves in the trees. Uh, there in Australia, they have a fascinating creature that we've seen on many different occasions. Uh, this is an animal I also saw pictured in National Geographic. And when I first saw it, uh, you know, I could see the, the teeth of the animal here look like miniature versions of the Tyrannosaur tooth. Again, they had the backward curve, a sharp point on the end and so on, a cutting edge on one side. And so it looked like a wild dog or something like that, some vicious predator. But as I read the caption here, it said it had these vicious teeth and so on for ripping and slashing destructively into what? Mangoes, papayas, bananas, and things like that. This is the fruit bat. Uh, and it's common in Australia, and it really is a pest as far as the fruit uh, farmers are concerned and so on. A lot of them have to put the blue plastic and things like that over the bananas to protect them from these fruit bats. They're really kind of cute. They're brown fur, big soft brown eyes. Uh, when they spread out their wings, they've got a wing spread about four feet. And we saw a group of them flying over a meeting one evening. It looked like so many Count Draculas going overhead. Uh, but they're really just vegetarians, not at all meat eaters. That shouldn't be too surprising to us. We read in Scripture uh, that when God finished his creation, he told our first parents to you, and then he went on to say, and to every beast of the field, every bird of the air, everything that creeps upon the earth, I've given every green plant for food. When God made the world, there wasn't any death. There wasn't any destruction. There weren't animals uh, ripping one another to pieces. There weren't people murdering and killing and having war and so on. God created the world in perfect peace and harmony. It wasn't until human sin ruined the world that God created that animals began to eat one another and very shortly after that that men began, began to kill one another. But even at that, some of the things that we look at that look so ferocious and so on uh, really are designed just for eating vegetables. Here's an awesome looking structure. Uh, now don't get confused. Some of you think this is a model of my nose, but it isn't, okay? <laughs> Uh, this is a fingernail, okay, just the little tip of the finger, the claw of an animal we find fossilized in Florida, the giant ground sloth. Now, it's a mammal, not a dinosaur. We haven't found any uh, uh, dinosaurs in Florida yet, but the giant ground sloth was bigger, heavier, taller than Tyrannosaurus rex and it had these huge claws. Here's a picture of one. You can see the claws of the fingernails just on the very tip out here, and that's all that you're looking at is one of these fingernails. Well, I have a friend of mine who's a very well-known fossil hunter, found one of these just 30 miles from our home, right across Tampa Bay, but it was twice as long as this one, a 31-inch claw. <laughs> Well, the good news is, in spite of that ferocious appearance there, it looks like these uh, giant ground sloths. Here's one with the skin on, a couple of joggers gone by for comparison. <laughs> it looks like they just use this thing just as a leaf rake, just to rake leaves out of the trees and so on. They were vegetarian. Well, there is one other possibility. Now, I'm not sure about this. When uh, scientists try to study the past, they, they, they're limited. You know, they, they weren't there, they can't see directly. So I'm not sure we can be positive about this, but there is one other possible function of this large claw. I'm not sure about it, so don't, don't hold me to this, but it could be, just could be, I'm not sure, this could be the world's largest nose picker. Now, I'm not sure about that, but maybe one, well, never mind. <laughs> Moving rapidly along. Uh, this giant ground claw is kind of like a bear. You've seen bears have these huge claws. And once in a while, you've seen film of a bear snatching a salmon out of the river, the camper out of the sleeping bag occasionally. Uh, but the vast majority of the time, those are just used to uh, eat fruits, nuts, and berries. 90% of the diet of the average grizzly bear is just fruits, nuts, and berries. And so it looks like when the Bible tells us God created things to eat plants and not one another, 
uh, science says we can understand how that could have been even though sin has made that change since. After the flood, God even told people that now they could eat meat. So if we think about man uh, and dinosaur living together, maybe that's not the problem after all. After all, if Job saw dinosaurs like the behemoth there and so on, that means they were on the earth at the same time that people were. As a matter of fact, if we look back into the record of what did happen at the beginning, the one written by the one who was there and made it happen, we find out that God created the land animals uh, on day six. And so that's when he would have created the large animals like the Diplodocus and the Tyrannosaurus and so on. And he created the flying and swimming animals on day five. So that would be like the, the uh, pteranodon, the pterodactyls, the flying reptiles, and then the swimming reptiles like the plesiosaurus and the ichthyosaurus and so on on day five. And they would have lived on the earth at the same time that man did. And that's not so preposterous after all. The dinosaurs aren't as uh, large as we often think they are, starting off as just eggs and so on. Uh, most of them were vegetarians even after the fall, so they wouldn't eat you even if they could. As a matter of fact, when man and large animals get together, who's in trouble. In fact, I know an animal twice as large as the one we used to call Brontosaurus. You could take two of these Hepatosaurus or Diplodocus, wrap the tail and neck around each other, and stuff them inside the volume of a, what? Great blue whale, that's right, great blue whale. Much bigger than any of the dinosaurs, but who's in trouble? Man or the great blue whale? And of course, it's the great blue whale that's nearly been hunted to extinction. When man and large animals get together, it's usually the large animals that are in trouble, not the people. And so if man and, and dinosaur did live on the earth at the same time in the past, that makes us wonder, what happened to those dinosaurs? I doubt if any of you saw them on your way over today and so on. <laughs> what happened to them? Where did they all go? <laughs> Well, here's one man's idea of what happened to the dinosaurs. <laughs> and I suppose that may be one of the better theories. There's been a wild assortment of theories of what did in the dinosaurs, a dinosaur plague, oxygen suffocation. <laughs> and uh, it's even been suggested that the dinosaurs died of constipation, that there was a fern plant in their environment they needed for proper digestion. When that fern plant died, the dinosaurs impacted themselves to death. Well, <laughs> good stirring stuff. <laughs> The popular theory now is what? All the dinosaurs are wandering around minding their own business and an asteroid, a chunk of rock from outer space. It's been calculated uh, that a chunk of rock just six miles or 10 kilometers in diameter hitting the oceans would slosh a wave of water over all of the continents. And uh, don't mean to upset you, but there are a lot of chunks of rock out there uh, six miles or 10K in diameter that could occasionally uh, have impacted the earth and so on. At least that's a thinkable idea. And what's the good news in a sense? The evolutionists have at last agreed with what the Bible has been teaching all along that the sudden catastrophic decline in size and variety of animals. We would tie it into the biblical flood. Uh, the Bible doesn't say one way or another if an asteroid might have been tied into that kind of an event. But at least scientists have come to recognize that the dinosaurs didn't slowly lose out in the struggle for survival over millions of years. Right at their peak, when there are dinosaurs on all the continents that seem to be so well designed, bang like that, they seem to have disappeared along with about two-thirds of the families of all the other animals as well. And if it was a great flood, then we can understand why the bones of these dinosaurs are found buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Think about that for a minute. If there really was a time, as described in the Bible, when all the high mountains under the whole heavens were covered with water, there ought to be billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Grab your pick and shovel and go out looking. By the way, around here is a great place to hunt fossils, including sea creatures all over in the ground around here and so on. What do you find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Well, some of you know about the floods of the Mississippi River that occurred not long ago. How many fossils were produced in the mighty floods of the Mississippi? Well, probably none, perhaps a few here and there. But in order to fossilize a dinosaur, it's got to be more than a few inches of mud, doesn't it? They're big animals. And so you've got to cover them and protect them, or scavengers will eat them up, tear up the bones, shred them. You'll never be able to find the pieces. Think of all the buffalo that once roamed the Great Plains of America. How many fossil buffalo are there on the Great Plains? Well, none. 
They just got eaten up by scavengers, broken up by sunlight, broken up by wind and water currents and so on. In order to become a fossil, an animal has to get buried under a heavy load of sediment so the scavengers can't get at it, so the wind, water, and sunlight can't tear it up and so on. But if you're a dinosaur, no little flood is going to bury you. <laughs> it's going to take something colossal. And many times, dinosaurs aren't found just here in Alberta, Canada. There are herds of dinosaurs all buried together, much deeper than any flood has ever occurred in that area before or since. Sometimes they're torn limb from limb, like the, uh, the rushing waters of a flood would do. Sometimes they're buried so suddenly and quickly, they're still in the same position, sometimes with their head thrown back as if they were gasping for that last bit of air and so on. And so it really looks like the vast majority of dinosaurs would have been uh, killed at the time of the flood, and that's why we find their fossils buried in those rock layers laid down by water on all the continents around the Earth. But, uh-oh, now I've got into trouble. If the dinosaurs were here when the flood came, where were at least two of each kind of dinosaur? Uh-oh, on the ark? Could there be dinosaurs on the ark? If a dinosaur stepped on the ark, wouldn't it just tip up, flip over, and sink? <laughs> well, that's what I used to think. But that's a misconception, both of the size of the ark and of the size of the dinosaurs. You know, a lot of children's books portray the ark as a little rowboat, a guy in a white beard and a giraffe standing behind him. <laughs> the real ark was much more awesome than that, a huge vessel. Its dimensions are given in Scripture. We know how big it was. And so the ark is a whole lot bigger than we usually think, and the dinosaurs aren't as big as we usually think. You know, the famous ones, Tyrannosaur and Diplodocus and so on, some of the dinosaurs never got any bigger than chickens. Imagine that, a dinosaur the size of chickens. If they hadn't died out afterwards, we could go out for Kentucky Fried Dinosaur, right? <laughs> and there were lots of little ones. In that one film, by the way, these are the horrible ones. Dinosaur comes up and bites you on the ankle. What do you do if a dinosaur bites you on the ankle? Well, you just shake it off. But then another one comes up and bites you, and then another one, then another one. And according to the movie, anyway, <laughs> each time they bite you, they inject anesthetic. So pretty soon, well, the rest of it's terrible. <laughs> but at any rate, little dinosaurs, big dinosaurs, and among the big dinosaurs, remember, they started off, you know, this size. Now, if Noah had wanted to cheat, he could have gotten all the dinosaurs on the ark in a couple of bushel baskets, right? <laughs> Just take the eggs. <laughs> but that wasn't God's purpose. God's purpose was to have them multiply and refill the earth, and so they would have taken young adults. Those would be the best kind to multiply and refill the world. But here's the possible difference between dinosaurs and us. We know that some reptiles and some fish living today grow throughout their life cycle. As long as there's plenty of food, as long as they don't get sick, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so on, there's a, a tortoise, the Galapagos tortoise, that can lay eggs and reproduce when it's about that big around. But if you just let it grow, it gets bigger than I can reach my hands across like this. And they used to let children ride three at a time on the back of these giant tortoises. But of course, Noah would take this size along with him. And so the Tyrannosaur that may grow to be 18 or 20 feet tall, Maybe the 12-footer is a mature adult. And the Diplodocus that may get to be uh, 70 or 80 feet long, maybe 15 or 20 feet. As a matter of fact, it's unlikely that the dinosaurs were the largest animals on the ark. There will be plenty of room for all the known kind of dinosaurs uh, to fit on the ark with the other things that Noah had with him, uh, the dry land animals that God brought to him. Well, now, of course, if the dinosaurs were on the ark, then they got off the ark. And so now we have to ask, what happened then? Well, when the dinosaurs got off the ark, things had changed dramatically. We know both from science and from scripture that the earth once had a mild climate from pole to pole. And so scientists find fossils of alligators and palm trees up in Alaska, fossils of alligators and palm trees uh, down in Antarctica and so on. And even if you put all those back, the continents all together in one, those are still at opposite ends of the earth. Interestingly enough, by the way, they've actually found the bones, fresh bones, of dinosaurs along the north slope of Alaska recently. These were originally found way back when, way back in the 30s, I believe it was. And they just thought they were caribou bones and things like that and so on. Just put them all in boxes and so on. And recently, a scientist began to look through these things and, hey, wait a minute. These aren't bones of, of caribou and things like that. They're 
dinosaur bones. Wow, look at that. Dinosaur bones that are fresh, that are not even fossilized. Maybe these are some of the dinosaurs that begin to multiply over the earth again. What's going on here? Some of you know, too, they can take a look now at proteins in DNA molecules in the dinosaur bones <laughs> and begin to get some kind of an idea what's going on here. Now, in the film, you know, where they, they resurrected dinosaurs and they cloned dinosaurs from this DNA, why, presumably they got dinosaur DNA out of the stomach of a mosquito preserved in amber. How'd you like to run into the mosquitoes that could drill into dinosaur hide? <laughs> <laughs> Fairly awesome creature. <laughs> but you wouldn't really have to, have to do that. The DNA is found in these bones, and they really do try to kind of reconstruct, see if they can clone these. A few years ago, they tried to clone mammoths and mastodons from some of the fresh meat of these giant hairy elephants that were left behind. There is a problem for evolutionists in all this, though. Those molecules don't last millions of years. They might last thousands of years, but not millions of years. And so if we've got some of these fresh bones, some of this DNA, some of this protein here, this is telling us that these dinosaurs died out not millions of years ago, but only thousands of years ago. Other scientists at one of the most prestigious radioactive uh, decay laboratories in the world looked at atomic radiation one little atom at a time in rock that contained dinosaur fossils. Millions of years old? No, they wrote a big paper in a prestigious scientific journal. We'll have to revise downward our estimates of those dinosaur rocks from millions of years down to just thousands of years. And so it looks like the dinosaurs were getting off the ark only a few thousand years ago, just as scripture would suggest. But when they got off the ark, what a change had occurred. Here before the flood, you had this mild climate from pole to pole, as I was describing something happened. And it looks like uh, what happened, among other things, was a vapor canopy that surrounded the earth and helped to hold in the heat had collapsed. That was part of that rain and so on and so forth. When volcanoes, the fountains of the great deep burst forth and, and triggered the collapse of the vapor canopy, all that moisture collapsed and so on that normally uh, holds in heat and keeps the earth warmer. That was gone. Some of the carbon dioxide. Our present atmosphere has only three hundredths of a percent carbon dioxide. But plants seem to be adapted to half a percent, over 10 times as much. In greenhouses, sometimes they pump in extra carbon dioxide to get uh, thicker, sturdier, more luxuriant growth in plants. Well, there was more carbon dioxide in the world before the flood, before that got tied up in limestone rock laid down during the flood. And so uh, these uh, uh, gases and so on contributed to what we call the greenhouse effect. Well, nowadays, when you hear the greenhouse effect and global warming, you know, people are in a state of panic. You know, we don't want the earth to get warmer and melt all the uh, remaining ice and so on and flood the coastal cities and whatnot. Uh, in fact, there's enough ice left on the earth now that if all of it melted, it would raise sea level 300 feet. <laughs> and where I have my classes in Florida, I'd have to lecture in scuba gear. We'd be about 300 feet underwater. <laughs> And a lot of the coastal cities would be political and economic chaos, but biologically it would be wonderful. It looks like that's the way the world once was. And there were many more forests and grasslands and things like that in the world before the flood. That may be one reason there were those giants on the earth in those days. <laughs> and not just giant reptiles like the dinosaurs, dragonflies with a wing spread of over two feet. A mosquito hawk with a wing spread of, maybe there were mosquitoes that big, <laughs> for those mosquito hawks to chase in Florida. In fact, on a river, we like to take our students on fossil hunting canoe trips. That's where the biggest beaver has ever been found. Okay, a beaver, if it stood up on its hind legs, so never mind its tail, stands up on its hind legs, would be over six feet tall. Beaver like that shows up in your yard and says, I want that tree. What do you say? Take it, it's yours. <laughs> I gotta argue with you. <laughs> and so there were lots of giants on the earth in those days before the flood, but after the flood, as those animals got off the ark, things changed dramatically. Well, you've heard of the Ice Age. And the Ice Age is not by itself an evolutionary concept. In fact, evolutionists have a terrible time explaining where there could have ever been an Ice Age. Now, at a maximum, when the ice covered the most it ever covered, it was about 30% of the continents, including a lot of ice above where we're standing right now. Okay, it didn't get down into Florida, but it did get down into the middle part of the United States, over a lot of Canada, not over all of Alaska, interestingly. Some of Europe, about 30% of the continents. We're still in the Ice Age, in the sense that the uh, ice still covers about 10% of the Earth. 
it began to melt back from maximum, according to evolution, about 8,000 years ago. According to creationists, about 4,000 years ago. Better agreement than we usually get on those things. Well, where'd, where'd the ice come from? What made it? Well, evolutionists are trying to come up with theories for the ice age that have the Earth slowly get colder and colder and colder. But if the Earth slowly cools down, you don't get an ice age, you just get a cold Earth. To get an ice age, you need two things, hot and cold. What do you need the hot for? The hot uh, to evaporate moisture from the oceans. If you had warm oceans, then you get lots and lots of evaporation. If you had cold continents, then that evaporated moisture could fall the snow and pack up to make these ice sheets. Where are we going to get conditions like that? Answer, right after the flood. Before the flood, the earth is mild and warm from pole to pole. After the flood, uh, land uh, cools off very quickly, so it gets cold quickly. The oceans take several centuries to cool off. The stage is set for the piling up of that snow into ice sheets that move down and only now have begun to melt back and so on. So it looks like the flood really explains for us uh, where the ice age came from and why that had such a devastating effect on the large animals that were on the ark like the dinosaurs. <laughs> but after the flood, it cooled dramatically and many of the large animals were unable to multiply and fill the earth with the ease that they had done before the flood. But there's another possibility. It wasn't just the climate change. Perhaps some of the last of these dinosaurs were hunted to death by people. Now, would it only be a crackpot creationist that would come up with some crazy idea like that? Not at all. You can read the same idea in the books put out by evolutionists and so on. Now, I'm talking here about mammoths and mastodons, these giant hairy elephants, the giant ground sloth and things like that, animals, many of which were bigger than the dinosaurs, and yet everybody recognizes, all scientists agree, that many of these were hunted to death by people in Florida and over in California. These would be the Indians that lived here before the white man settled this particular area. Some of you maybe have been to the La Brea Tar Pits out in down, right in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. <laughs> this lake of tar with all the skyscrapers up around it and all that. And so they find these uh, uh, big elephants and so on, and they also find people. They find my ancestors, the American Indians, buried in there with the mammoths and mastodons, the saber-toothed tigers and so on. Sometimes they see areas where uh, knives were used to scrape meat off the bone. They see spear points and arrowheads still embedded in the bone and so on. We were doing a tour at the State Museum down in Florida. We're shown a huge skull. The skull was like this and horns like that of an extinct buffalo with an arrowhead embedded right between the eyes and so on. And so uh, scientists agree that it was really people that hunted a lot of large animals to extinction in just the last few thousand years. On New Zealand, there used to be a bird called the moa bird, M-O-A. This was a bird that was taller than Tyrannosaurus rex, even if T-Rex stood up. That wasn't as heavy, but it was a great big tall thing, hunted to extinction not by the white settlers with high-powered rifles, but by the native Maoris just using spears. A huge bird like that hunted to extinction. Well, you can imagine one bird would, you know, make a lot of meat for the tribe. <laughs> you say, I want the drumstick, and it takes five of your friends to haul over to your table and so on. <laughs> yeah, so that may have been part of it, just meat for people as they begin to multiply, and also trophies. As you very well know, people like to hunt large animals just for trophies. So it's possible that man did in the last of these large creatures in many areas around the world. But if that's so, that means we ought to have some kind of historical record that man and dinosaur have lived with each other in recent times, in historical times since the flood. And we do. Uh, there are lots and lots of records of man seeing dinosaurs. Some of you know the name of the Greek historian Herodotus. Uh, he confirms a lot of the events that happened in the Bible and so on. He saw and recognized a flying kind of dinosaur, and we know which one he saw. There are two main kinds. The Pteranodon has a big beak and a big bony crest, but no teeth and no tail. That's not the one he saw. He saw Rampharynchus, the one that has a beak with teeth in it, no bony crest and a long snaky tail. He saw the flying Rampharynchus, and he saw fresh bones of these in a valley there in Egypt and recorded it for us. One of the most dramatic is an encounter between an Italian peasant uh, and a dinosaur, May 13, 1572. 
Okay, here was an Italian herdsman going to market and so on. He hears a hissing animal in the bush beside the road. What do you do if you hear a hissing animal in the bush beside the road? Usually one of two things, run like crazy or kill it. And so in this case, he killed it, banged it on the head and so on. Well, if you've just killed an animal, what do you do with it? Well, you take it into the local biology teacher and ask for extra credit. At least that's what my students do. <laughs> so I've been heir to quite a few things for the extra credit approach and so on. So he dragged this animal into town. A local biologist, a well-known textbook writer, Ulysses Algervanis, took a look at the thing. It was all covered with scales. It was obviously some kind of reptile, but he'd never seen it before. But he described the outside, the inside, dissected at the works and so on. All of the other animals he described in this book are perfectly accurate. And so it looks like now that we found other bones of this creature, it was a small dinosaur, Tanistrophius, scaring Italian peasants uh, not very long ago at all. Uh, one of my favorites is this little creature right here. And so some of you have seen an animal that looks like this. Now this is a little bit gory right here. <laughs> this was an animal dredged up by Japanese fishermen 65 million years ago. Oh uh, no, sorry about that. <laughs> Found by Japanese fishermen back in 1977. Now it had already died, it wasn't alive, but it hadn't died long ago, it maybe died a few days ago. Fish had begun to pick away at the skin and all that and so on, but you could still see the small head, the long neck, the front flippers and the back flippers, and sure enough it looked like the dinosaur we call a plesiosaur, one of the swimming kind of dinosaurs. So the Japanese got all excited about this and, and their intention was to bring it back to Japan, but that's a long way from New Zealand to Japan. <laughs> and so as they're heading back and misquote the Bible, he stinketh. Everybody's getting too sick, so they wrapped it up in nets, dropped it overboard with buoys to mark it, and sent the Japanese Navy out to look for it. But they did more than take pictures. They also got bone and muscle samples. So the, you can see it's not a shark, it's not a... Uh, mammal, it's not a giant sea lion or some shark or something like that. It has bone in it and so on. It's not really like anything except that kind of plesiosaur. And so that seems that's what the Japanese got all excited about. Uh, summer before last, my wife and I spent about three weeks in Japan with the creation science group over there and got to go to this museum in Iwaki, northeast of Tokyo, where they house the plesiosaur remains. And I got a little tie clasp that shows these bones. They got all excited about this thing, and I think rightly so. There are other areas in the world today from which we get reports of dinosaurs. There are evolutionists, uh, an evolutionist who believes that there are dinosaurs still living in the Congo Basin and it's found in the science of cryptozoology, the search for hidden animals to go look for these things. The York Peninsula in Australia is really a difficult place to get into. No roads through there yet, and that's one of the areas they may still exist. Well, regardless of whether there are any dinosaurs living on Earth at the present time, we can say this much. What we know about dinosaurs fits very well with what we read in Scripture about the origin and history of life on Earth. If we talk about dinosaurs, we'd say they were created on days five and six. The land dinosaurs, like behemoth, were created with us on the sixth day of creation. The swimming and flying forms would have been created on day five. Dinosaurs come in all sizes. I mentioned little chicken size. There's a little mouse dinosaur that was only about that big and so on. They come in all sizes from small to large, but even the largest began life small as they hatched out of eggs and so on. Most of the dinosaurs were vegetarians. Now, you don't make movies out of vegetarian dinosaurs peacefully grazing on plants, <laughs> uh, but most of them were vegetarian. Uh, even after the fall, even after death corrupted the world and so on, uh, many of the dinosaurs remained vegetarian. Only a few became meat eaters. Some undoubtedly did, probably not Tyrannosaur, although some others would have been meat eaters. Many were drowned in the flood. That's why we find their fossils buried in rock layers laid down by deep water in several pockets on continents all around the earth, from the Gobi Desert to central uh, plains of Canada, uh, to Montana and Wyoming out in the American West and so on. And so the uh, dinosaurs that were not drowned in the flood were those that were on the ark, the dry land dinosaurs. There were plenty of room for them. They got off the ark only to be caught either by the climate change or perhaps hunted to death by people. As, uh, and th these are some of the records of people having seen these dinosaurs. That plesiosaur, by the way, may be the animal that God is describing to Job in the 41st chapter of Job. Behemoth is described in Job 40 in chapter 41. 
is a whole chapter about an awesome animal called Leviathan. Now, Leviathan isn't a translation, it's a transliteration. Just took the Hebrew letters, changed them to English so we could pronounce it and so on. And as it described, it's much more than a crocodile or an alligator. Those are fairly ferocious. But even when those things got to be 40 feet long, the Egyptians still hunted them and turned them into to suitcases and pocketbooks and shoes and things like that. In Florida now, we've got hunting season on alligators, and they're getting some 20 feet and so uh, along there. But again, man still hunts these things. In fact, in Clearwater, you can get alligator tail omelets <laughs> if you so desire. And they've got regular hunting season on these, but not Leviathan. The Bible tells us nobody had ever succeeded in wedging a spear between the plates of a scale. It really matches the description of one of the larger members of this group of dinosaurs. Well, that leaves us with just one question, I guess. What is a dinosaur? Now, some people would object to my talking about a plesiosaur and a pteranodon, that, that they may belong to another group, uh, but they can't really object to that anymore. Dinosaur is no longer an official scientific term. It was coined by uh, the British anatomist Sir Richard Owen, meaning terrible lizard, back in 1841. Uh, and at that time, it looked like they pretty well knew what they were. But as we found more, when you try to describe, well, what does it take to make a dinosaur, most of the definitions that would include a dinosaur would include an alligator or a Komodo dragon. There are great big lizards, monitor lizards, Komodo dragons on the Indonesian islands. Uh, they get to be more than 10 feet long and eat pigs and deer and things like that. Great big uh, uh, mean looking things and so on. Uh, and they are meat eaters. Uh, there's some fairly large uh, uh, lizards in Australia, the goannas, get about six feet long and so on, that are really kind of kind of pets and vegetarians. They'll come up and beg uh, food from you at a picnic table. That is kind of interesting <laughs> to have a six-foot lizard come up and beg for a piece of your sandwich or some of your salad and so on. Uh, but they're interesting. They had giant forms of those goannas that are pictured in the museum there. Uh, but they don't, they don't fit dinosaur classification either based on the number of uh, openings they have in the skull and so on. Well, uh, there's one enterprising uh, evolutionist who says, well, dinosaurs are birds. In the next time you see a flock of Canadian geese migrating overhead, <laughs> you say, well, there go the dinosaurs. I guess it's spring or fall again. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. That was the idea that was kind of put forth in the movie. At least the idea that dinosaurs related to birds has given us the idea that dinosaurs are much more agile and alert than we ever thought before. And that's kind of wonderful. They're much more fit uh, as products of the master's hand than we've thought about in the past. But that doesn't really seem to be very realistic at all. Uh, you know, pluck a chicken, you've got a dinosaur. No, there are really some significant differences between those two. So I think probably the best definition I ever heard of dinosaur was one by a friend of mine, Dr. Paul Ackerman. Dinosaurs are missionary lizards. <laughs> and that's the way I'd like for you to use them. The things that we know about dinosaurs, as much as they're talked about in the media, at school, and all over the place, they offer an excellent opportunity for us to use what we know about God's world in terms of dinosaurs to share what we know about God's word. That's kind of the theme for the conference we've got for this whole weekend. What we see in God's world agrees with what we read in God's word. Jesus said one time, if I tell you earthly things and you don't believe me, how will you believe me if I tell you heavenly things? The good news is we can believe what the Bible tells us about earthly things and we can trust those wonderful promises about the heavenly things to come. Well, that concludes our presentation. And one more thing, that's to tell you about Creation Magazine. It's the easy way for your whole family to stay up to date on creation and evolution. Creation Magazine is your family's vital defense against all those evolutionary textbooks, nature shows and magazines that are bound today. 56 pages of full color with no paid ads are sent to your home four times a year. Subscribing helps the message to keep on expanding as you're able to share this exciting material with others. Once again, thanks for joining us. And if you have any questions, contact us direct.